Hi, my name is Viljana Tkach, and I direct uh, Yara Arts Group uh, from La Mama Experimental Theater in Ukraine East Village uh, in New York. Today, uh, Yara Arts Group is happy to present a virtual series we're creating with the Ukrainian Museum on epic songs. Um, we start with a series of presentations about Zinovi Stokko, uh, who brought the Ukrainian epic uh, song tradition to New York um, in the 50s and then developed it in the 60s. Today we'll look at um, Stokko as an instrumentalist on the Bandura. At the top of the show, you just heard uh, his masterful Turetsky Tanitz, Turkish dance. You'll hear more from uh, samples from Stokoko's recordings, and I'll talk about uh, the Bandura history and style. And then master Bandura player Julian Kitaspi will join us and share recordings and personal stories. And finally, we'll have special guests from Ukraine, Mitro Hubyak and his student Vitali Romosyak, who are inspired by Stokoko's recordings. Dobry večer. Я Вірляна Ткач, художній керівник Яри Мистецької групи «Українській дільничі Нью-Йорку». Сьогодні поговоримо про бандуру та почуємо інструментальні записи з нові штоколка з 50-х, 60-х років в Нью-Йорку. Тоді поговоримо з бандуристом Юлієм Китасним про штоколка та його впливи, а в кінці послухаємо, як Грають нині Дмитро Губяк та його студенти в Україні, натхнені репертуаром Штоколка. If you'd like uh, a program from today uh, with the list of music we played, information on the people and how to get it, you can download it uh, as a PDF from Yara's homepage, and that's Yara Arts Group, one word, dot net. Uh, our event is bilingual. Everyone will speak their own language and we'll summarize in translation. Наш вечір двомовний має програмку, але тільки по англійській, яку можна скачати з нашої веб-сторінки www.yaraartsgroup.net. Нас маленький ритуал, яким починаємо кожну подію. Дінько. We have a little ritual we start our shows. Welcome to Yara Arts Group, dedicated to the theater and all the poetry, music, and images that inspire it. Uh, today, Yara is not at La Mama, but in virtual space. Um, Bandura was once used to accompany epic songs, and today it's called the Ukrainian National Instrument, played at special occasions and displays of folk culture by men, women, children, and it's made from wood and has anywhere from six to 60 strings. So where did it all come from? The Bandura actually combines elements from several different instruments. These strumming instruments are found in Central Asia 
and are used to accompany epic singers in Turkey, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan. We will have a special segment on Stokoka as a singer of Ukrainian epic songs in October, and also a virtual world epic festival, uh, one part of which will be featuring Kyrgyz epic singers. And um, so you'll be able to hear one of these instruments, the one in the lower left, for yourself then. Don't miss these events. But let's return to back to the bandura. The bandura combines the long neck of these strumming instruments and the capability to accompany epic in, uh, songs with, the more, with um, the more developed set of strings reminiscent of husu, another instrument that was used to accompany songs. Uh, both of these instruments have a long tradition in Ukraine. Um, murals in St. Sophia, built in the 11th century in Kiev, depict musicians of the time, including a medieval husli player right there in the lower right corner. The bandura is traditionally associated with Kozaks. And here's a painting of Kozak Mamai playing Kobza, an instrument reminiscent of the Central Asian Kofus, which we were looking at in the first slide. Um, the theory that Polochi introduced this instrument to Cossacks doesn't seem too far-fetched, but we'll never know since archaeological evidence for instruments made of wood and, you know, gut string really can't exist. Uh, artistic representation are then the best we can hope for. Uh, and there are literally hundreds of paintings of Mamai playing an instrument just like this. We also have this beautiful image that Taras Shuchenko created in the 19th century. Uh, 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 and we can see how the Ukrainian version of the instrument developed by then. Shuchenko is fascinated by songs of the Kobzars. The Madura is often, often called a Kobza. Today we use these terms interchangeably, and Shochenko even called his book of poetry the Kobzar or the Kobza player. Here's uh, what today uh, we call Starosvit, the Bandura, old time instrument, and it's very similar to the previous image we saw in Shochenko's drawing. They say Shochenko heard Ostap Veresai sing, and Veresai, you see, in with his wife here in the picture. And his instrument represented the oldest part of the tradition in the 19th century. After Verisai died, this version of the instrument went totally out of style. And it would be revived only 90 years later. And this is a recent reproduction. Um, Shuchenko, oh, this is from one, uh, a drawing from one of his in the first Kubzad. Most of what we know about the bandura, the music and the performers uh, from the past, we know because of 19th century uh, create, uh, romanticism create this great interest among artists and scholars and the general audience for folk culture. And people started collecting stories and words which could be written down first of all, and then later music and the instruments. Now this obsession with folk culture was not unique to Ukraine. Uh, Hans Christian Andersen started collecting fairy tales that were first published in 1837, and so did the Brothers Grimm uh, a little bit earlier actually, but this happened in almost every country in Europe. And since city people started um, you know, hearing these folk tales and also learning folk songs from all over Europe. One of the most um, important early proponents of the bandura was the Ukrainian composer Mykola Lysenko. He's here in the, on the right, who in 1873 presented a paper on the Ukrainian dumas and the songs performed by the Kozar Ostap Beresai, who you saw previously. A year later, he pub published a little brochure with Veresai's repertoire, and previous scholars had noted down the words of the Kobzars, 
but listen ko would eventually understand how the music the kobzars played could be notated and therefore preserved. What we notice um, uh, in the 19th century is that the bandura instrument itself is going through great changes and that more and more strings are added to the instrument. So here we have 1860, 1885, and 1905, and what we notice is a plurith, uh, you know, more and more strings. Um, and traditionally, the Kobzars were blind and were led by young men uh, who were their guides, really boys. Um, they were, the Kobzars were street musicians who performed historical songs when they were in stately homes, rowdy songs at the market, and sacred songs when they were near churches. This was never a mass phenomenon. By the end of the 19th century, there was only about several hundred Kobzars performing in the northeastern part of Ukraine. So we have in those areas right there where we have Poltava, Kharkiv, and Chernihiv right now. Um, there are three types of styles of playing that develop by the early 20th century, and it's best illustrated in this one pho photograph. To the left, uh, is the Kiev style. The bandura is held sideways and the right hand plays the melody while the left hand is stuck on the neck doing the bass strings. This style is much easier to learn for sighted players. On the right is the Kharkiv style. The instrument itself is held flat, flat out to, to us. The left hand plays the me main melody but the right has access to both the bass and treble strings. The strings are set up in, in a very big fan, so it is more comfortable for the left hand and also gives both hands better access to all the strings. This allows for a much richer field of play hands and, um, and also a better sound from one bandura. In the center, we have a transitional style. It is held like a Kharkiv, um, uh, it, like in the Kharkiv style. The, the left hand does the bass, but occasionally plays treble strings. In um, 1902, um, there was another archeological congress um, and it included a, a section on ethnography and several papers on the Bandura and the Kobzars. Pnat Khodkevich, was also was asked to organize a performance. And um, the Kobzars usually perform solo, uh, each by themselves, and rarely even singing duets. And what Khodkevich does is he organizes a concert. This introduces the idea of a capella to the audience and, and also to the performers. Who, and therefore, it really changes the tradition. And for the first time, we have concerts of Bandura. Technology also changes the scene. Uh, music could be recorded. You didn't have to learn it from someone who was playing it live. <clears throat> the Ukrainian writer Lesio Krinka personally financed the recording of Kobzars on wax cylinders. The Kobzar not Honcharenko, who's on the left here, was the best instrumentalist recorded at that time. The man standing next to him is Mr. Borodai, who brought the newest Edison machine from the US, which was used to record Honcharenko. Now, one of the tunes that Honcharenko recorded would later be played by Zenoti Stokl.
the conferences, performances, and recordings popularized the bandura. People are interested in hearing it. Nat Khotkevich learned to play the instrument and um, also learned the, the repertoire of the Kobzars, and pretty soon he was playing it as well as any of them. And in 1909, he published a handbook on how to play the bandura. People like uh, Bandura's Potapenko here gave lessons. Here's an ad, uh, a flyer. Um, you too can learn to play the Bandura in one month, guaranteed. And um, it's, it's in Kiev. Um, and of course, the Kiev style is much easier to learn because you can look at the strings when you're plucking them. So the Bandura becomes popular in Kiev among the educated uh, city folk who, su who support the new Ukrainian government when it comes to 1917 through 20. Uh, a cappella was organized in Kiev and gave its first concert at the Bergogne Theater in November 1918, in the last days of the war. Um, the Kiev style is much easier to teach and soon students from all over the country were learning the Kiev style, like these students in Chernyuti in the 30s. But musically, the Kiev uh, style is more limited because one hand is restricted on the bass. Over the years, there would be many uh, revisions and rebuildings of the instrument to make it chromatic and be more like a piano to get a richer sound out of it while still playing in this um, Kiev method. The biggest proponent of the Kharkiv style is Hnat Khotkevich, who had, like we said, studied the Kobzars, the repertoire and instrument, and really is trying to connect the bandura not so much to Western instruments as to its own tradition. And um, Khotkevich um, also teaches classes. In uh, 1928, he has a class in Kharkiv uh, at one of the, uh, universities and in, in 30 he heads the Poltava capella and introduces them or has them adopt the Kharkiv bandura in a uh, way of playing. But in the 30s all the developments in the Kharkiv bandura in Soviet Ukraine come to a grinding halt. The Poltava capella is forced to merge with the Kiev bandura, street Kobzars, not Khotkevich, and his students suffer from Stalinist repressions and Khotkevich himself is shot in 1937. These are the documents about his execution. The Kharkiv style of Bandura playing really disappears in Soviet Ukraine. <laughs> That was Zinovi Stokoko playing the bandura. Uh, Stokoko, unlike everybody else we've talked to, was born in Western Ukraine uh, in 1920, near the town of Berezhane. Uh, there it's marked in red. Um, his father had purchased a bandura in Prague, where many of the activists and cultural figures from the national movements in, in central Ukraine were in exile. Uh, when once the Soviet Union, um, once the Soviet Union occupied, uh, or actually Russia occupied Ukraine, it became Soviet Ukraine. The bandura was um, a gift Stokok's father had bought for his older brother, but his brother died. And this traumatic event propelled Zinovi into two areas of study, bandura and medicine. Stokoko's first Bandura teacher was Yuhim Klevchutsky, who had studied in Prague with some of um, the exiles. 
He then studied with Yuri Sinhalevich in Lviv and later was influenced by uh, Kharkiv Bandura's Leonid Haidemaka, who we see in the picture here with Hnat Khotkevich. And Shtokolsko's other big influence was Rehori Bajul, who was uh, Kharkiv Bandura's, who had uh, Khotkevich's manuscripts. And that is where Shtokolsko learned the Kharkiv style and the uh, um, also the repertoire uh, by Khotkevich Hutkev uh, had collected. This is why his style of playing is very different from the others and why he could produce a much richer sound. At the end of World War II, there, was, there were over a million Ukrainians in Europe in camps for displaced people. Like the, many of these refugees, Stokoko emigrated to US. He came in 1952 and settled in New York. A place um, where Ukrainians met in the East Village in New York was Surmach's store on 7th Street. Miron Surmach um, wrote a book about him, uh, his store, and he claimed that soon after Stokoko arrived in New York, he, of course, walked into Surma and introduced himself. And he said he played the Bandura. And um, Surmach believed him. Uh, Surmach said he could record him in a private studio, and that's exactly what they did. And Stokoka recorded a few days later um, most of what we have. Surmach released a record in 1952, uh, and in the next couple of weeks, Stokoka recorded many more pieces, but Surmach did not issue any more records. Eventually, Surmach gave the tapes Stokoko had recorded in uh, 1952 to Stepan Maksimyuk, who compiled a collection of two long playing records that came out in 1970. Unfortunately, this was already two years after Stokoko died at the age of 43. <laughs> Welcome, Julian Katasti, who is the Bandurist of New York today. Thank you. I started on the Bandura playing dance tunes from Stokolko's repertoire. I had a good teacher, my father, Petro Katasti. When my father was 16 years old, he was the youngest member of the Ukrainian Bandurist Chorus. And that is when he first met Stokolko and heard him play. Recently, he told me the story of that first meeting. I first saw Stokolko when he played two evenings for the members of the Bandurist Chorus and their families. This was a private concert in the place we were staying a large room on the second floor of a building filled with cots. <laughs> Stokolko just captivated everybody with his performance. Uh, the families, especially the women, just fell in love with him, with his, uh, with his juicy bass voice, his style of performance, the sparkling interludes that he played between verses. And we all laughed out loud when he performed humorous songs and threw in spontaneous spoken commentary. On the second evening, a young Bandura student came with her instrument. 
she was already studying with someone in Lviv. She asked me to show her something to play. But what could I show? The bandura I was playing then was terrible. It had no sound at all. Uh, I couldn't sing my solo songs uh, because my voice was changing. And I knew all the Bandurist chorus instrumental parts, but uh, there wasn't a whole lot interesting to show there, just a few introductions and interludes. I remembered the dance tunes that I had just heard Stokoka play, so I started picking them out by ear. Zenovi heard this and came up and showed the rest of the tune. And so I started learning them myself and uh, showing them to the girl as well. And so that's the story. And my father kept on playing these tunes and teaching them. Uh, when he moved to Detroit, he wrote them down. And in the 1960s and 70s, uh, they became a common repertoire for a generation of Bandura students in North America. So let's listen now to a recording of Petro Ketasti playing one of those dance tunes, Mulodichka. <laughs> instrumental side of the traditional Kabzaris repertoire made its way to North America as a living tradition that goes uh, all the way back to Hanat Hancharenko and Astap Veresai. Later, uh, when I was uh, living in New York and looking for an inspiration for my own music, uh, I found it in Stokoka's recordings especially the hours of unpublished recordings that he had made at home in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, this music inspired me to explore the Kobzar sources uh, that Stokolka had drawn on. I even learned to play uh, the older instrument, the old style bandura, Starosvitska bandura of the blind Kobzari. And I studied the dume, the epic songs, uh, to better understand what Stokoko had found there. This music was very, very different from uh, most of what I had grown, grown up playing. Uh, the cave style bandura that I played was, if you remember that far back, it was exactly like the one in that very first picture that Virlana showed. And it was set up to play uh, music uh, very much in, uh, the, in the system of Western harmony, Western music theory, uh, major and minor scales, uh, 
a, a layer of chromatic strings set up just like on a, uh, just like the black keys on a piano keyboard. Uh, music that was organized in in uh, 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 chor chords and triads in uh, uh, modulations to around the circle of fifths, all that kind of uh, stuff. And what I heard in Stokelko and found in the transcriptions of the Kubziti was something completely different. Uh, they didn't, I mean, you couldn't think the same way about it. Uh, and you couldn't, uh, and you really would have a hard time playing it on the instrument, on the modern instrument, that are the key of style instrument. Um, the old time bandura and the Kharkivska bandura that Stokoka played were modal instruments. They, um, a, you could tune only one scale, right? A, there was only one layer of strings. So you could tune, like on a modern instrument, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, but uh, you could also uh, tune other scales. And it's these scales that give uh, the music of the Kobzari uh, and this music and Sokolka's performance is very special feel. Um, so um, once I started to play this instrument, um, I came to understand a little bit better uh, how Stokolka used some of these elements to make his own virtuosic instrumental pieces like the Turetsky Tanets uh, that we heard in the beginning of the program. Uh, I had a try at doing something similar in uh, the title track of my CD, Black Sea Winds. Um, I play it on the old time bandura. Uh, the piece is semi-improvised and it uses the, uh, the scale and some of the structure of the Duma melody uh, sung by Ostap Veresai uh, on those old Lysenko transcriptions. Uh, the prelude quotes part of the melody directly. pick up uh, the piece uh, partway through and at the end you'll hear that same melody come back again as uh, a kind of a epilogue postlude.
That's wonderful. But Julian, um, what about the basement tape? <laughs> well, uh, in 1989, uh, I traveled to Ukraine for the first time. Well, and, tell us what they are, first of all. Yes. Uh, Stokoka had uh, been recording himself all along uh, through the 50s and 60s. And when he died, his friend Levko Maestrenko uh, took care of his recordings and uh, later transferred them to cassette tapes and let me have a copy. So that's uh, when I say that I was listening deeply to Stokolka, that's, uh, that's what I mean. And when I went to Ukraine in 1989, I had four sets of these cassettes in my luggage. Levko had made four more copies of the complete Stokoka basement tapes uh, and asked uh, that they be given to Banduriste and other musicians in Ukraine who would uh, get it. Uh, one of these people was um, uh, Professor Vasily Harasimenko, uh, who directed the Bandura program at the Lviv Conservatory and also designed and crafted banduras. He was already interested in the Kharkiv style. And here was a complete repertoire that could be used with students. Uh, so by the time that I was next in Lviv, which was about a year and a half later, uh, Hirosemenko had already made his first Kharkiv style bandura and the first students were learning the ropes on the new instrument by studying and transcribing the Stokolka tapes. Uh, one of the, one of Harasimenko's students was Dmitro Hubiak from Ternopil, whom we will meet in person in a minute and will now meet through his playing. So the metro came from Ternopil, near where Stokolko was born, to study Kharkiv Bandura with Harasimenko uh, when he was six years old and already played the cave style instrument. Uh, I'll ask him what those first lessons were like. Uh, Dmitro, uh, Ну, перш за все, я мушу сказати, що попри те, що Зінові Штокал кумі земляк, вперше з його творчістю так усвідомлено, з його музичною творчістю, бандурною творчістю, я познайомився саме у Львові і саме через оці записи, які basement, basement tapes, які прибули разом з Юліаном до, е, до Львова. І ці, ці записи я слухав у про свого професора Василя Герасименка. So the first time uh, Metro had heard Stokolko's music was, uh, was uh, through Professor Herasimenko and those basement tapes. І е, мушу сказати, що Ці, ці записи, як мабуть, на кожного, хто їх слухає, справили на мене величезне враження. And they made a huge, they had a huge impact on me, like they probably do on everybody who hears them for the first time. Навчаючись у консерваторії, мені було ну, дивовижно, я не міг зрозуміти, як може грати 
людина, яка не навчалася в консерваторії, як вона може настільки віртуозно володіти інструментом? How could somebody who never studied at the conservatory be such a uh, be such a virtuoso on his instrument? Отже, перші мої уроки розпочалися, ну, в першу чергу, із прослуховування творчості Зіновія Штокалка, а також бандуристів, львів'ян, які вже опанували харківський спосіб гри. Це Тарас Лазуркевич і Олег Созанський. So his, uh, his first uh, lessons were consisted of listening to the Штокалка tapes and watching some videos of uh, the students who'd come before him. Василь Євтухович Герасименко, коли вперше дав мені в руки харківську бандуру, він поставив її саме так, як ви могли бачити на малюнку, як повинні тримати бандуру всі, хто грає харківським способом. І таким чином? Ви поставили на моїй лапі. Uh, just like it is in the pictures, how you're supposed to hold the Pandura Kharkiv, uh, Kharkiv style. He said, that's how you play. Для мене це було дуже складно і зрозуміти і, і, і відчути, оскільки гра, грати на сучасній харківській бандурі е, хроматичної, яка є хроматичним інструментом з двома рядами струн, зовсім не, не дивлячись на струни і не маючи абсолютно ніякого досвіду, ну, це було просто нереально і неможливо. Uh, initially, it was very hard, especially because uh, the instruments, uh, the instrument that Harusimenko had made, uh, that I was playing on, uh, he'd uh, he'd experiment with, with adding a second chromatic layer of strings, and that just made things uh, very complex to find your way around. Тому мені довелося вже наслідувати своїх старших колег учнів Василя Герасименка, того самого Лазуркевича і Созанського, які вже опанували харківський спосіб гри. І я спостерігав, яким чином вони тримають інструмент, і, і в результаті все вдалося. Я вважаю, що саме творчість Зіновія Штокалка і той факт, що його записи прибули в Україну на початку незалежності нашої держави, це був той поштовх і імпульс, який дав, якби створив такий фундамент для відродження харківської бандури в Україні. Um, I think that the, Dmitro says that the arrival of those basement tapes in Ukraine, um, right at that moment, at the beginning of independence, <clears throat> really laid the foundation for the future uh, rebirth of Kharkiv style playing in Ukraine. Василь Герасименко, попри те, що він сам не володів харківським способом гри, але він багато чув про цей спосіб гри, він спілкувався із своїм старшим колегою, із майстром бандур Іваном Склярем, який захоплювався теж ідеєю створення харківської бандури та її відродження в Україні. The idea Kharkiv Bandura had, had uh, floated around in Ukraine and Harasimenko had talked about it with a uh, Bandura maker in Kiev, Ivan Sklar. And, um, um, but he'd, uh, he'd actually, Harasimenko himself had never played that style. Але Василь Євтухович, як талановита людина, а я вважаю, що він був геніальною людиною, геніальним митцем і творцем бандур, він е, побачив у харківській бандурі її величезний потенціал і захопився тою ідеєю, ідеєю відродження харківської бандури, е, побачив у харківському способі неосяжні можливості, 
перспективу розвитку цього способу гри і цією вірою в інструмент захоплював також своїх студентів і мене в тому числі. Герасименко really believed in the idea of the Kharkiv Bandura and he knew how to communicate that to his students um, myself. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mitra uh, what um, what techniques and sounds did, did he find on those recordings that made him believe made him believe in the potential of the Kharkiv Bandura. Дмитрій, які прийоми і штрихи ти знайшов у цих записах, які тебе особливо вразили? В першу чергу, харківська бандура у виконанні в руках Зіновія Штокалка звучала як оркестр. І я вважаю, що саме завдяки тим особливим штрихам яких ми не використовували при виконанні київським способом. The Bandura Mishtokal has had sound of an orchestra uh, exactly because of all those uh, special techniques and licks and effects that we couldn't play on the Kiev style instrument. Ось, саме такі, такі прийоми гри, як тремолянду, різноманітні трем, види тремолянду, репетиції, глісандо, секстолі, все це в дуже віртуозному виконанні Зіновія Штокалка, воно надає величезного різноманіття його, його грі, і особливо це важливо і помітно в його епічному репертуарі, в думах, що допомагає йому ніби малювати звуком, така звукозображальність цих ефектів. The, uh, the Shtokov uses these techniques, especially in the epic songs in the Duma, to, um, to, 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 to picture. Uh, here's, here's one of them now. Перший, який я хочу продемонструвати, він дуже ефектний, яскравий і часто використовується в думах. Така секстолі. Також, також різноманітні види репетицій. Це репетиції, які можна робити такими унісонами або інтервалами, терцієм. Cross-hand patterns with one finger, unison, and thirds. Репетиції з використанням відбою у лівій руці також. І також такий прийом, як глісандо, наприклад, він може вважатися дуже простим, але це настільки може бути настільки різноманітний цей прийом і настільки багаті зображальні можливості, що можна ним зображати як подих вітру, або бурю на морі, або якийсь вітерець у степу, ну, будь-які. So, so like various glissandos, you can create the step wind, like he just did. Uh, now, now play the storm. Zahrai, uh, Zahrai Buru. <laughs> Також у поєднанні, це важливо, що можна використовувати в поєднанні зі специфічними кобзарськими ладами. 
And all of these uh, uh, techniques, especially these, these glissandos, uh, change their effect from the way that they're uh, combined with these different kabzaic tunings. Ну і і треба сказати, що також окрім того, що ми використовуємо в роботі з Василем Герасименко, ми опановували не тільки репертуар Штокалка, а також і використовували різноманітні перекладення для бандури, перекладення класичної музики, і це теж свідчить про багатство можливостей Харківської бандури і харківського способу гри. And of course with him we also played uh, other music, we played uh, classical descriptions uh, and other pieces that could show the, you know, just the richness of the possibilities of the country style. Наприклад, сонати Ніколо Паганіні, або твори Йогана Себастьяна Баха, чи Дмитра Бортнянського і так далі. So it's possible to play the music of classical composers. Наприклад. Ір, розкажи трошки про, про те, що ти робиш тепер. Um, I'm asking my brother to tell us a little something about his work today, uh, the, the students that he has, and uh, what they're up to right now in Ukraine with Kharkiv style bandura. Я також полюбив харківську бандуру і харківський спосіб гри, і також бачу в ньому велике майбутнє. І саме тому намагаюся пропагувати цей спосіб гри в Україні, навчаючи своїх вже учнів, створюючи репертуар і працюючи над досконаленням інструменту. Kharkiv Bandura in Ukraine um, uh, through teaching my own students, uh, through um, through teaching Створюючи репертуар, написання музики, репертуар, and so on. І також експериментуючи з інструментом, з конструкцією інструмента. Оскільки для того, щоб поширювався інструмент, потрібні, звичайно, учні, учням потрібен репертуар і виконавцям потрібен інструмент. Я дуже радий, що в мене є студенти, які навчаються харківського способу гри, і молодь, наше підростаюче покоління бандуристів, серед яких є теж дуже талановиті і зацікавлені харківською бандурою. And I'm happy to be working with, uh, with young students, you know, with a new generation of students um, and people who also are becoming real fanatics of Karki Bandura. Іноді доводиться створювати для харківської бандури відповідний репертуар і для своїх студентів я пишу спеціальні твори. So, uh, so I've been uh, I've been trying my hand at uh, uh, creating music for the Kharkiv Bandura for my students to play. It says that it's a good. Zaraz počujemo tvier jak tis tvorib jak raz tvorib tih. Da. You'll uh, we'll hear a piece that Petra made from. Uh, uh, from uh, a couple of parts of these compositions that he made for his students. And tell us a little bit about the Bandura, on which this will now be performed. So, working and promoting the Kharkiv Bandura, I, as my teacher, Vasil Gerasimenko, I also met with the problem of the instrument. So, the instrument is not for learning. І мені довелося думати над тим, як, яким чином вирішити цю проблему. 
Well, well the, biggest, the biggest problem that I faced was uh, the lack of instruments for students. And so we've been working to, uh, to figure out a solution. І я дуже радий, що завдяки новітнім технологіям з використанням комп'ютера зараз сьогодні стало простіше експериментувати із конструкцією інструмента. І саме завдяки цим можливостям мені вдалося спроєктувати разом із своїми друзями, однодумцями, спроєктувати нову модель харківської бандури. And so, uh... Using the latest technologies, uh, you and your friends have uh, made uh, a new model of Harkiv's Bandura. I think it's the one that you're holding right, right now, and it's the one we'll see in a second, in a video of uh, Dmitro playing uh, his composition, Paraphrase. and all the great new developments in the Kharkiv style of playing that are happening today in Ternopil. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Thank you. friends, if you enjoyed our virtual event today, you'll be glad to know that is creating a virtual series on Stokholkom with the Ukrainian Museum in New York. Julian, what are you, what kind of other events would we're going to have in this Stokholko series. Well, you already talked about um, uh, what's coming up later in the fall uh, as part of the Festival of Epic Songs. We're going to get back to Stokholko's Dume and to Dume in general. 
Um, but our next episode is going to focus on uh, some very rarely heard Thakalka, and uh, which uh, has to do with other narrative forms. Uh, we will uh, hear uh, his student Morris Jakowski's work with uh, uh, with fairy tales uh, with Bandura accompaniment and a similar piece from the Metro's student, Safika Al-Hadidi. Um, and we will, uh, we will also listen to and talk about Stokelko's very interesting experiments with the creation of medieval uh, Kiev's uh, epics, Belene, uh, the epics of uh, Prince Volodymyr's court. Um, and um, do you want to say anything more about that? Well, we have a special guest for that too, uh, Marco Stach from Toronto, who will talk to us about that. Um, and then we also will get into uh, Sokoko's modernist poetry and experimentation with the Bandura, which is, of course, your territory. And we'll, um, we'll listen to some of this and read some of his poetry and maybe put that together. And uh, we'll also talk with members of the Experimental Bandura Trio, a New York group that picked up where Stokelka's experiments left off. Well, this is the 100th anniversary of Stokelka's birth. And now we're celebrating it. How are you celebrating it? Um, <laughs> Stokelka is the person who helped preserve for us Ukrainian epic tradition and also developed it in New York. So our diaspora not only preserves, but also creates Ukrainian culture. Friends, if you have pictures of Ukrainian cultural events in America or personal or family stories you'd like to share, drop us a line or give me a call. In our next, our next event will be um, on September 14th, the premiere, and, but you can watch it anytime. So if you have uh, photos or films or no star, or if you knew Stockholm, let us know. We'd love to have you um, be, join us somehow. Now, um, let's hear it first of all for Julian Katasti, Dmitra Hubiak, who is just so wonderful to share all this stuff with us. Thank you. It's very late in Ternopil right now. And his student, uh, Vitali Hromoshak, who you'll hear in just a minute. Our visual designer uh, for this series is Valdemar Klusko from Kyiv. And thank you, Darian Fiorino, for running our tech. Give us a wave there. And a big thank you to our sponsors. We couldn't really do this without you. And it's the New York State Council on the Arts and um, Bandura Downtown and all the friends of Yara Arts Group. We rely on your support, so stay healthy. We have a theater program for today's events, which you can download uh, on our website and tell your friends about our events. They can listen to the recording of this event or all our past events anytime. Links are on our website. You can hear some of Stokoko's recordings on YouTube, and now you know you can take a look. Um, our exit music will be Dmitra Hubiak's student, Vitali Hromoshak, playing the very tune you heard the Novi Stokoko play at the very top, the amazing Turetsky Tane.
amazing. Abdirliana <laughs> Katch, thank you and good night. We're off the air. Okay. Thank you.